Hi, it's Buck, Bacon Trees. Thanks for stopping by. I decided to do another live sound video. I haven't done one of those in a while. And in this case, it's how to get a great stage sound in medium, small and medium sized concert venues. And the one thing we have to consider is why is stage sound so critical? Well, there's a few reasons for it. One of them being the talent must be comfortable on stage or they won't perform very well. I have not only mixed a, you know, a ton of shows, I've played a ton of shows too, so I've been on both sides of the fence um, quite a few times. And I know that when I'm comfortable on stage, and everybody's comfortable on stage, we usually have a great performance. Um, if it's not controllable, it's usually harder to mix because you're always battling with the stage sound. And in a lot of clubs, the stage sound is like, once you get the front of house up and running, the front of house might be five to seven dB sometimes more than the stage sound. So you can't have the stage sound too loud because then your front of house mix is going to be too loud. And then, of course, you're just trying to cover up for the, the uh, improper stage sound and then the audience isn't going to have a great time either if they're plugging their ears. I can't plug my ears through my headphones, but you know what I mean. And if things are just out of control, the audience will think the sound person is out of control, meaning is it just way too loud, like excruciatingly loud, that type of thing. Uh, if they see you struggle with the mix, they'll think you're out of control. So stage sound is critical to get right. And people are more likely to remember bad mixes than good ones. So step one, a close miking, distant miking does not work. Everything has to be close to the source, as close as possible. Um, the, you know, putting instruments direct wherever possible, put them direct because it means less open microphones and more open microphones equals more noise. I have to sometimes remind the vocalist to eat the mic get as close as possible, like this close to the microphone when they're singing, because, you know, as you move away from a mic, more background sound, especially, you know, guitars and drums and cymbals and whatever comes into that microphone. You get the person to eat the mic as close as possible. Um, a question to ask, do you really need overheads in a club? On a large stage, that's different. You're going to need overheads, right? You're going to put them there anyway, because just in case you need them. But on a very large stage, you'll need overheads because you're not going to hear all those high frequencies that well through the air. Step number two, control the guitars. I am a guitar player. I've played guitar you know, many years on various different stages over the years. And um, I, in the first few years, I really didn't know what I was doing. Somebody like a sound person had to educate me. If the guitar is 110 decibels on stage, A weighted, they're almost 100 dB, 98 dB or so, following the inverse distance law at the mixing position. Number three, stuff the kick. I put something in the kick drum uh, to stop the internal resonance. Unless it's like I, I've mixed, um, I put a microphone, a large diaphragm dynamic in front of a, a Canwood bass drum. I think it was an 18 or 20 inch Canwood bass drum. I didn't need anything in that thing. I think the guy might have had zero rings in it or something, but it sounded amazing on its own. So there was no need to stuff that particular kick. But there's a lot of kick drums out there that need to be stuffed. I usually put um, the microphone halfway inside the kick drum and then I'll adjust it. I want to get some beater frequencies, some snapping of the beater. So I asked keyboard players, can you put your master, whatever your loudest sound is, put your master at 75%. So when you go for a solo, you're not going to, you're not going to, you know, blow my speakers or something like that or redline my system because that's happened before. I will put a limiter sometimes if I sense that the person is going to really overdo it with their uh, keyboard solo levels. But um, just a limiter at the top to prevent distortion and stuff like that. Clear up the vocals. I, this is where I've mentioned before, just lowering the lower mids. Um, the D curve, as I've call, I started to call it a couple of years back. Um, microphone stands should have rubber feet, of course. All the aim monitors, aim the horns of the monitors at the singer's face. Uh, make sure the horns aren't covered, otherwise they're not going to hear the high frequencies. Uh, if somebody needs more monitor before I turn it up, I always put the monitor on a milk crate or something to get it that much closer to the singer's ears. Remember the inverse distance law, every time you double your distance in a free field from a source, you lose six decibels. So you're gaining two, three, maybe even four decibels by putting it, you know, on a milk crate. Um, and I go up on the stage, especially for singers, and I listen to what the singers are hearing on stage and what everybody's hearing. So I'll walk around the whole band during sound check. It's one of my steps. So I know exactly what they're hearing. So when they make certain requests or comments, I know exactly where it's coming from because I know what a good stage should sound like.